boxing, MMA, it's, for, for me, I believe it's some of the hardest jobs in the world. Mm. When you've got to do that road work, you've got to push your body when you, when you don't feel like going to the gym, you've got to go to the gym, you've got to push through boundaries that you never thought you'd get through. And then when you retire from boxing or, or fighting, um, if you put that same work ethic and discipline into a business or another sport, or, or sorry, not another sport, into a business or something you're passionate about, that's surely going to go that direction, right? Everyone you meet every single day is fighting a battle you may know nothing about. We're all in the process of overcoming. I'm Justin Wren, and my story has been heard by millions of people through my book, my TED Talk, podcast interviews, TV shows, professional fighting, and my foundation, Fight for the Forgotten. I believe we are all overcomers if we choose to overcome. We all have the option. I've been given the opportunity to overcome childhood trauma, sexual abuse, immense bullying, depression, suicidal ideation, substance use disorder, and I am a two-time suicide survivor. We are here to have conversations with some of the greatest minds of our time. Get ready to be inspired and to receive the tools and game plan to win this fight called life. Thank you for being here, for showing up for yourself. You, me, we have overcome 100% of our darkest days. I'm not done yet, and neither are you. This is your invitation to overcome. All right, today is a special episode. We're trying out a new studio at Ibble Studios, and go check out their app. But today, we have an incredible guest. Uh, Tony Jeffries, the number one <laughs> boxing educator in all the world. Not just the UK, not just the US, but the whole world. How are you, brother? I'm great. Thank you for having me on. You know, I, I see I'm the number one educator. Maybe I'm not, but who knows? I, I, I'm saying you are. All <laughs> oh, right. Um, well, yeah, if you yeah, say yeah. I am, I must be. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, for me, you are because you're my go to guy. Right. Um, but I think that's a, a worldwide consensus. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's been crazy. Um, obviously, I've got the background in boxing, but now I'm known on, on social media and YouTube. And uh, yeah, it's it's great. It's my passion. To, yeah. Boxing's my passion. Now I can help as many people as I can on social media with it. It's uh, Yeah, it's changed my life. Yeah, well, I think we have a lot to talk about. I'm really excited. You're, like, you're one of the guests I'm most excited to have. And I've had a lot of really incredible guests. So, um, Mid, you see that to everyone. No, I, I don't. Go, go, go listen. I think this might be one of my. <laughs> he looked at only me. Times. Yeah. Mm, he looked at a you. little bit. He is very excited to have you. I'm very excited. Mm -hmm. And this podcast is called Overcome. And basically, the, the meaning behind that is life's a fight. And how do we rise up and overcome life's greatest challenges? And how do we win this fight called life? And one of the statements we've said over. Uh, and the listeners have heard is you, me, we have overcome a hundred percent of our darkest days, like dark times come, but like we still have breath in our lungs. And right. so, um, how do we, how do we just take everything that comes to us? What are the tools, the tactics, the techniques, just like a fighter has in a, in a fight, but how do we do this and, and apply those principles to the fight of life? Right. And that's why I'm really excited right. okay. to have you on. Because of all your experience, you've had, I think it's over 100 fights yeah. from amateur and pro. Yeah, I had 106 fights in my me, in me career. Wow. I started when I was 10 years old. I won seven national titles, a European gold medal, uh, Olympic bronze medal. And in 2012, I got forced to retire from boxing. Doing it since I was 10 to 27 uh, because of hand injuries. And that's talking about dark moments of your life. That was a dark moment in my life. didn't know what the hell I was going to do next. Yeah. Because, you know, fought since I was 10. That was my life. Yeah, your identity. My identity. Yeah. What, what I was known as. And, yeah, and then that got pulled away from us. Mm. So it was like, now, now what do I do? Yeah. Start drinking and start drinking alcohol. And that took my mind off off the, the, the problems and put weight on. But, I mean, as you probably know, when you start drinking, it puts you down like a little uh, a rabbit hole and you, it's, it's not good. Yeah, well, we're good at, we're definitely going to get into that. Um, we have a special guest in the studio, Dr. Jess, that's worked at the Olympic Training Center. She's here as a sports psychologist in Austin. But right before you even came in, she was talking to me and she said, it's, it's one thing to retire because you want to, and it's a completely other thing to have to retire. Right. And so it was hand injuries? 
hand injuries, yeah. Now, was it a yeah. surgery that either didn't go well or you didn't recover from it? I didn't recover from it. I had surgery on, on both hands. Um, wow. And I had a hole in one that was a tear in the other tendon. And yeah, I did everything I could to continue fighting, but I just couldn't. How many times have you broken your hands? Uh, I think three times it's been, three three times. And I've had three surgeries, two on one hand, one on the, one on the other hand. Uh, and that's important for fighting, I guess. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a bit hands. important, yeah. yeah. But um, my, my problem was, I, I got, when I was young, I would, I would punch hard as a as a twelve year old. I would punch hard, and I didn't know how to uh, wrap my hands properly, protect my hands properly. I didn't have education on it, so I used to just be, be boxing, and my hands would swell up. And I was really happy that they'd swell up because I'd go to school, and I'd be like showing my friends, look at my mm. knuckles, and I'd think I was like tough and all that. And that kind of went on through my career. Obviously, I learned how to wrap my hands. But they were, they were pained. They were in pain all the time, um, until it got to the point when I was 27. After I was, I've achieved quite a bit in boxing, where I couldn't button me me, me shirt, I couldn't zip me trousers, I couldn't turn a key. Wow. My hands were so bad, so I needed to go in for this major surgery, and uh, yeah, they didn't recover. Yeah. Well, I'd love to talk. I mean, we have so much we can talk about, but it was wasn't 2008. That was Beijing. That yeah. you won the Olympic bronze medal, but going back, and everyone hearing your your accent, what 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 kind of UK accent is that? I'm from f- yeah, I'm from Sunderland in the northeast of England. Okay, uh, yeah, I've, and then I've, you lived in Manchester. I, li- I lived in Manchester when I was trained as a professional and as an amateur. I trained in the world class training program, Sheffield as well. So I trained around around England yeah. quite a bit. But yeah, I'm from Sunderland, the, the northeast. Could you tell us a little bit about? Because I think with the UK being much older than the US and even probably for, for, for fighting, for boxing, um, you guys have a deep, deep history. And how ingrained is that in the culture? How'd you get your start? Yeah, it, it is. Because you were young, 10 I was years old. 10 boxing. years old. My, I, I was getting bullied growing up and I asked my mom if I could start boxing. Oh, really? She was like, no way. Wow. So that's why I got into wrestling first <laughs> was because uh, she was like, you're not going to get hit in the head. And I knew I was going to be a fighter, yeah. but you were doing it at 10. Yeah, it was, it was kind of the opposite. I was getting bullied and I was like, right, you're going to the boxing gym. Um, my uncle was a professional boxer and you had to be 10 to start boxing. So when I turned 10, my granddad took me to the gym and, you know, I, I didn't really like it. And, and then me, me dad started taking us. And he, he kind of forced us to go to the gym. He was like, if you don't do boxing, you're not playing outside with your friends, you're grounded. So I had no option but to, but to box. Um, Did your dad box too, just not a pro boxer? No, he, he didn't box. Me uncle was a pro, it wasn't, wasn't the, the best. But, uh, and then when I was 10, I started doing it. And then I had my first fight. I lost my first fight. And I was like, this is, this is not for me. Fought the same guy again, a few weeks later, lost again devastated really really scared about fighting him because he's already beat us and i wanted to wanted to quit then and my dad was like you're not quitting you, you keep going and i had so many arguments with my dad about this I had my next fight won me next fight and i was like wow it's the best feeling ever as you know <laughs> best feeling ever and then start winning and then i won a national title got selected to fight for england and then it kind of snowballed from there I was like, well, i'm pretty pretty good at this well let's go into that a little bit because i I played, my dad was a professional sports photographer. So I got to meet like Michael Jordan and Shaquille O'Neal wow. and, all, and, and Brett Favre, like just NFL, NBA, MLB, like he was the official photographer for all the Dallas teams, but we'd travel all around the country. And so I knew, well, I was, I was kind of forced to into athletics, but the one that he didn't know anything about was the one I chose wrestling because I couldn't really have him telling me what I should have done or could have done or right. anything else. But my first year, year and a half, um, I only won one match by one point. And heavyweights, we sweat a lot. So I think he literally maybe slipped in a puddle of sweat <laughs> and I just fell on top. And um, But I had other people telling me, um, you should quit. My dad was telling me, you should quit. This isn't your sport. I had coaches tell me, you should quit. You're no good at this. Um, wow. But for you, those first two losses sound like they were heavy. And yeah. you're scared. Um, and I know you have that win that you went back to, but how important is it when you when you're getting into something to 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 not quit, to at least see it through, to give your chance, well, yourself a chance. If if I if I quit back then, 
which I wanted to do, I wouldn't be sat here right now. Mm. I don't know where my life would be. Um, so obviously you've, you've got you've got to keep keep trying and keep keep going for it. Um, and I'm thankful now for my dad. He used to always say, you know, you'll, you'll thank me one day, you'll thank me one day, because I was argue, always arguing with him. And Were you thinking, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah right, mate. <laughs> I'll not. And I remember when I finally went to the Olympics and come back with a medal, we had a, a big party, and uh, I got my dad on the stage, and he wasn't expecting this. And that's when I said, like, dad, this medal belongs to you now. Wow. And you said that, I'll thank you one day. Well, today's that day. I'm getting goose pimples now talking about this. And uh, that was the day that, you know, I really did. And he, and, and he was right. For all them years, I was like, nah, I'll not thank you ever. But <laughs> eventually I, I did thank him. Yeah. And what a way to do it. I know, right. With an Olympic bronze yeah. medal. That's incredible. Keeping that medal. Um, go ahead, Amy. Um, around that time, though, even if you wanted to quit, were you feeling like some kind of confidence or something about the bullying? Like, did that start to shift a little bit? Did you see a little bit of a difference there? Well, once I, I learned how, how to punch, um, I, I was getting bullied at school. I was getting called. I used to have freckles on my face and I, I was skinny and I changed schools. And the, these kids were calling us all the time. And I kind of went home when I was 10 and I was upset. And me, mum and dad were like, what are you upset for? And I was like, these, these guys are calling us this. And the instructions that I got off my mom and dad is, tomorrow when you go to school, you're gonna punch them bullies in the face as hard as you can. But I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. You are, you're gonna punch the bully in the face as hard as you can. And I said, like, I'm not. And again, they forced me to go to school and punch the bully in the face as hard as I can. And I'm 10 years old. Never, you did it? Never, yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> Went to school, seen them. So, oh, no, uh, here he is, the, the, the freckly face. Boom, smashed him in the face as hard as I could, bust all his nose, and that was the last time I ever got bullied, mm. ever. So that gave me the confidence right there that changed the path in life for, for us, I think. Yeah. You know? Let me let me ask you this on bullying, because I grew up getting very heavily bullied. Um, I, had a, I had a moment when I went to, there's two big bullying moments where I went to school and it was in front of the whole school that they bullied me. and. Uh, had my clothes thrown under the, while I'm in the showers, like thrown under the, wow. the the bleachers when the volleyball team's out there, all sorts of stuff. But one time I went to a costume party with all the popular kids and dressed up and got there, hit with flashes of light, it's cameras, and people are laughing and my eyes adjust and nobody's dressed up, it's just oh. me. And the girl that was my crush crushed me saying, I can't believe you thought you were good enough to come to my party. The boy next to her said, you're worthless. The boy next to him who organized the whole thing, had the whole school in on it, said, you should just kill yourself. Fuck. And so that was when I was 13. You believe what people say about you. Yeah. I hadn't fought back. And now I think it's really challenging times because there's 160,000 kids each and every day, at least in the U.S., that skip school because of bullying. That's 3 million school days lost wow. every month. I was living in Oklahoma. There's like an at-risk youth survey. 28.9% of their high school or middle schoolers are dealing with depression. 15.1% have uh, contemplated suicide. And then something like 7.1% of those, 7%, like seven out of 100 kids have attempted suicide. And a wow. lot of it goes back to, to bullying. And, but today's age, um, in time and school systems, they have such a zero tolerance policy. Meaning if you get in a fight, you get in trouble. Yeah. And so even if you're being bullied, now Texas is doing some things where if you're being assaulted, like if you have an appropriate response or you're, you're, you're protecting yourself, a self-defense, um, they'll, they'll review it and then try to make appropriate action from that. But when I was growing up, it was so zero tolerance that I got jumped at school and just because I was involved, they didn't throw a punch. The teachers came. I got suspended for two weeks just because I was attacked. Wow. And um, so from that moment, I felt like I couldn't protect myself. Wow. I couldn't fight back. But your story is so different because these guys were assaulting or like verbally assaulting yeah. you. And you hit them back and then and then it never happened again. Right. So I wonder if you have uh, cyberbullying is such a huge thing right now. Yeah, that's huge right as well. Now. But even the thing that I did and it worked, I don't know if I would recommend that because I, I did a little bit of boxing, so I knew how to punch. Now, if a kid's listening to this and they're like, 
I need to just go and punch a bully and you throw a punch and they miss and then that kid could get seriously hurt because the yeah. bullies could all jump on them and so I'm not saying that's the right thing to do I'm saying it work for me yeah you know and that's uh, like would I give my kids that advice go and punch the bully in the face I don't know if I, if I would or not yeah but I've got my kids in jujitsu now and boxing so mm. trying to help them with that but uh, what you said there on, on the cyber bully and that's like and obviously never experienced that you never experienced yeah. that it's like that's like a, a different level yeah although we i'm sure you have and i have experienced the uh, the, the the keyboard warriors sure the, the haters on there uh, which does affect you a little bit even yeah. at, even at my age now i'm 37 and i'll get ten thousand great comments and i'll get one or two like and i'm like oh, look that steals the, your focus like, yeah that, exactly yeah. crazy isn't it yeah it is yeah. it is the one cheap comment from the cheap seats it doesn't even matter yeah. uh you can like think about oh man that kind of take the i don't know the wind out of your sails right yeah but i think on cyberbullying for at least from my perspective what i've heard i've been able to go to like over 100 schools and like speak to students and stuff and man it's like the difference between our time and their time is you and me at three o'clock or whatever it was we got to go home and basically escape it right at least have a a break from it and yeah. we might be thinking about it but it isn't following us home or ramping up when we get home because now the bullying goes from school to social media it lives there it can amplify there and they just feel like they can't escape right um, yeah and it's it's always there it's always something yeah so that's that's, that's really really sad it must be even harder you know i, I would guess because a lot of people see it as well mm -hmm. but i mean what, what you said with your experience in front of the full school that that's that's awful as well yeah 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 well then so i what you said about your 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 children i think that is a at least a great recommendation like it's a case-by-case -case basis yeah. and and all that but um i know martial arts saved saved my life at least changed my life like having that focus the outlet of of going to wrestling this podcast is brought to you by Onnit.com. Onnit.com slash overcome. Use the code overcome to save yourself 10% on, I'm holding in my hands, the Alpha Brain Focus Shot. It's in this cool container. Amy's got the website pulled up for I you do. guys watching on YouTube. Did you drink your Focus Shot this morning? Absolutely. I, th I, I thought you did. I did too. Yeah. How do you like it? Oh my God. I feel so good. I always feel Because it's early right now energy. on a Monday. Yeah. You know what? Yeah. This is... This is one of the earliest podcasts we've done. Well, this is early for you. Early for you. <laughs> well, to, to go on the show, yeah, for sure. And it promotes focus and energy, supports a positive mood state, helps manage mental stress. And for me, I truly feel like it helps me get in the flow state faster, stay there longer. Whether I'm going into sparring, I had one before I went to sparring yesterday, and I had a four and a half hour training session because they were stacked. So I went from... 12 to 1 30 and then straight over to the gym from 2 to 4 30 4 40 came home tired last night mm -hmm. but i was focused the entire time i feel like it's very reliable about yeah. how i'm gonna feel the more i've used it the more doing this show really the more i'm able to know that when i drink it i'm gonna be on point my brain's gonna be functioning really well i feel generally good and that's been so nice to be able to know that it is not going to suddenly make me jittery or suddenly make me feel nauseous or whatever it is. Yeah, well, that, that for me is important because some of the products with caffeine, which just has some caffeine, but it's like plant-based and it's healthy and it's a low dose. It's not jittery bad. It's not jittery mm -hmm. at all. And sometimes I'll have, you know, one of those energy drinks or something and then I'm over caffeinated, over stimulated. And then I feel like I can't think as good That's not good. because it's, it's bothering me. Yeah. And all the alpha brain line is super reliable. The capsules, my favorites, the, one of my favorites are the instant then the black label and my all-time favorite is what we're talking about now the alpha brain focus shots they're incredibly good tasting the tropical flavor they also have peach i believe but mine's the tropical because it's passion fruit and that's it delivers consistently fruit. and sometimes i'll take one and i'll split it between two smoothies when i make it for us in the morning i'll just throw a little bit in each mm -hmm. and just just adds a little something to like our protein powder and the fruit and whatever else we've got in there yeah, and thank you so much on it for supporting me, my comeback to fighting, uh, fight for the forgotten, and this podcast. They make it possible. So please support 
our sponsors who honestly I think have the best supplement line in the world. And yeah. our favorite products, Alpha Brain or Total Human, get the best in one packet uh, of morning support and a night support. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being here with Overcome with Justin Wren and onit.com. Be sure to use overcome. that code. Mm -hmm. Use the code Overcome. Yep. Save yourself some money. And so what do you think the sport of boxing has has done in your life, at least for being able to apply like what you've learned from fighting into maybe the fight of life? Right. Well, a big thing, what we mentioned is, is the confidence. Like I'm mm -hmm. sure you like I'll walk anywhere in any bar or a any street and I've, I'm confident now in me, in me ability. Like I'm, I'm not scared of, of much. Um, obviously, a gun or a knife can, can change all that, but it's. It's just really helped me with with confidence in life. As a young kid, I don't think I was that confident, but now now I've got that that confidence in, yeah. which I mean, you know how important it is to, to be confident. Um, and then obviously the discipline that comes with it has been amazing, you know, and that's helped me with translate from when I retired into business, and that's why I've had success in in businesses since since then, you know. And what I struggle to understand is boxing MMA it's for, for me I believe it's some of the hardest jobs in the world mm. when you've got to do that road work you've got to push your body when you when you don't feel like going to the gym you've got to go to the gym you've got to push through boundaries that you never thought you'd get through and then when you retire from boxing or, or fighting um, if you put that same work ethic and discipline into a business or another sport, or, or sorry, not another sport, into a business or something you're passionate about, that's surely going to go that direction, right? Right. And a lot of fighters out there don't do that. Mm. A lot of fighters out there, they, they, they'll retire and then they'll work on, on a building site or, the, or they'll not know what to do with their lives, which for me, it's like, if you find something that you really want to do, and I'd love to speak to the doctor about this, uh, why, why can you not put that work ethic into that and it'll go that way? Because that's all I've did. Yeah. I've kept that same drive and hunger in the business and my business as well. Right? Yeah, that's great to think What about. do you think about that? Yeah, I think it's awesome. Well, if, if you guys, uh, listeners, are happening here, Sirens, we're down here on 6th Street. Uh, that's uh -huh. this little side note. But no, I think you're really, um, I think you're really onto something because I have seen... I've seen champions. Um, it's a little strange to compare because I lived at the Olympic Training Center as a national champ in wrestling, and, and it seems like, for the most part, wrestlers do better once they retire than fighters do when they retire. And I'm not sure why that is. I, maybe because wrestlers, on average, the, to go the college wrestling route, like you go through four years of college and education, but I, I think one of the one of the things that's tough about professional fighting is I at least know the at least the saying is ninety or ninety five percent of the guys retire with nothing. Yeah. Um, and it seems to be that, and I've seen UFC champs or even uh, Hall of Famers that once they retire, they kind of lose that sense of identity. Yeah. And they don't parlay it into something else that they're passionate about in life, like. It's all they got. And I think what people can take away from seeing you and some other athletes out there is you can really expand it and use it as a springboard. But it is kind of uh, concerning that I think I think fighting such a roller coaster, the highs are incredibly high. Yeah. And then the lows are lower than most know. Yeah, right. Yeah. And but there definitely is life after after uh, boxing or yeah. after fighting. And that's something when i retired i didn't see that i didn't mm. understand that and now i've got an education program helping boxers get into the fitness industry uh, that's through box and burn yeah th our, our, our box and burn academy uh getting fighters into the fitness industry and and because boxing is one of the biggest trends in fitness right People, everyone wants to learn uh boxing for fitness and we've helped quite a few fighters uh, do this and transition into that but there's a lot of them out there, like, you know, that would rather go to the building site and, and, and do that work. Yeah, well, I mean, 
we know it. we have a common friend and uh even at least a lot of times my boxing coach uh jeff meadows jeff yeah. meadows black sheep boxing i think what's so cool about his story is one he wouldn't have his gym or his uh fight academy without you he right. wouldn't have black sheep boxing if you hadn't been there to, with your program and him going through that um because you really inspired him to to be an entrepreneur and the really great thing is when I found Black Sheep Boxing, I was just as excited to join there as any other of the top fight gyms I've ever been to in the world. And the reason was the purpose behind right, it. Right, yeah. Um, I think, I don't know if this is still the statistic, but when it begun, at least 40% of the members were there um, because maybe they, like the name, they felt like maybe the black sheep of the family because they dealt with addiction and uh, substance abuse and maybe depression or other things, but they found boxing as a way to have an outlet. And because, how Jeff says, there's never a time you're more present than whenever you're boxing. Right. Whether you're hitting a bag, you're able to get shit out and move yeah. energy. But if you're sparring, like you can't be worried about what happened earlier today. Mm -hmm. You can't be worried about tomorrow. Um, regretting the past or in fear of the future, it's like you're right there. You're, you're in right the zone. Here. Yeah. Yeah, people see it. Boxing is like a form of meditation, mm. although the complete two completely different things. If you think about <laughs> meditation and boxing, but that's that's what you're saying. It's totally right. You're in the zone. You're not thinking about anything else that's going on. Even when you're uh, hitting the mitts or hitting the bag, you know you there's so much to focus on with the techniques and the form and the breathing. And when someone's throwing punches back at you as well, you, you're totally present for that moment and you're living in that moment right there. And I've just started doing jujitsu, as you know, and yeah. I feel the same in jujitsu. When you've got some guy trying to strangle yeah. you, I'm like not thinking about anything that's going on at home. I'm thinking about how will I get this guy off us? Yeah. And, I, and I'm loving it. Yeah, so jujitsu, there's a great saying, and I'm sure you've heard of it, but it's all about becoming comfortable being uncomfortable. Right, yeah. And yeah. how would you speak that, at least from your fight experience, or even jujitsu, is like how, for the average person that hasn't been in a fight, how do you start to learn being comfortable and being uncomfortable because we're such creatures of comfort right right that's what we seek it's microwave this it's it's instant message it's everything yeah. now 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 and going through that uncomfortable time will get you to good things yeah you've just got to constantly be uncomfortable and then it becomes second nature really yeah you know the, the more you do it uh the more comfortable you get and like with jujitsu i've been doing it for a few months now and just being this close to another human being, that's not my wife, mm -hmm. was a bit weird for us. Having yeah. a guy straddling us, like, and I'm like, this, we're a guy. Yeah, I'm like, this is a bit weird, isn't it? <laughs> you know, so that's an uncomfortable uh, yeah. position to be in. But then, I mean, it's weird to fully mount a guy or take his back, <laughs> yeah. or put in a rear naked choke or a crotch lift. <laughs> yeah, or you've got an arse, <laughs> you've got someone's arsehole in your face, and you're like, this is a bit weird, <laughs> uncomfortable. But then, you know, you get comfortable having someone's eyes in your face after, after yeah. you've done it a few times. The, the worst for me is whenever, uh, so I'm a wrestler, I'm normally on top, right? But whenever I do pull guard or I'm, I'm working from that position and I'm sweaty, he's sweaty, and off his forehead or nose comes a drop of sweat <laughs> and I'm trying to breathe. And too many times I try to mouth breathe and so it'll just drop right in my mouth oh. or hit my tongue and all of a sudden it's, it's literally salty. Like, I'm like, I've oh, not experienced that yet. Yeah, you haven't experienced it yet. You will. <laughs> <laughs> That's it's, funny. It's, uh, it's different. Yeah, but the, the, obviously, the more you do it, like, you, you've experienced that a few times now. So yeah. it's like, oh, that's just happening again. Yeah. But uh, the more you do it, obviously, the, the more comfortable you get. And I've just done a post on, on Instagram the other day talking about, I think, how everybody, no matter who you are, male, female, yeah. whatever age you are, should learn how to throw a punch. Mm -hmm. And just because we, what we spoke about earlier on about the confidence that, that it gives you, you might never need to throw a punch in your life, but I think everyone should learn how to throw a punch. I watched a video of some, it was a, a bully in a, looked like a bully in like a fast food restaurant, and he was out and he was starting to push, push this smaller guy and to start having a fight. Neither of them could fight, neither of them could throw a punch. And I was just thinking, if that smaller guy practiced punching, that that he would have dealt with that bully, but instead yeah. he ended up getting through the floor, and his head banged oh, and all that, and it was it was awful. Uh, but I think everyone should learn how to football. Yeah, how important is it to to know it and not need it instead of need it and not know it at all? Yeah, I think it's a very important. It just gives you that little edge, that little uh, bounce in your step if you, if you know how how to throw it. And 
and hopefully you never ever have to throw a punch ever yeah. in your life because fight, fighting's stupid outside. Yeah. Uh, if you're not getting paid for it, why do it? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It, it's Unless very it's dangerous. And I, th I think everyone should should learn it. And it's the thing is about punching. It's not that hard to learn how to throw a punch. Ten minutes a day in a mirror, you can learn how to throw a punch. You know. Uh, and the, and the benefits to it is, is huge. Yeah. Well, maybe we can go to what was what was a, a highlight of your career? Um, I mean, the Olympics. What's that like going to Beijing to represent your country, even your family and your dad? Right. Yeah, it was your dad. unbelievable. So when I was sixteen, I won like three or four national titles. I was I was the champion of the UK. I got put on an eight-year training program for the two thousand eight Olympics in in the in the year two thousand. Wow, thinking that far in advance. Yeah, it's my year. Because they knew from all the statistics that the peak age of an amateur boxer was around 23, 24 before they turned professional and all that. So they wanted to get the champions of 16, known in eight years, they're going to be 23, 24 years old. And I went through the full eight years of this program, traveling the world, finding different champions here and there, doing lots of training with the Great Britain boxing team and to, to go to the Olympics. So just to qualify was unbelievable. I remember I fought in the World Championships in Chicago and I fought uh, uh, the Netherlands champion, then the Belarusian champion, uh, and now I was fighting the American champion, the American team captain in Chicago, uh, Christopher Downs, in front of mm. thousands of people to qualify for the Olympics. And he obviously he wanted to qualify. He just beat the favorite of our weight category. And the crowds all shouting, USA, USA. And I'm the underdog there. And I fought him and and beat him. And, and that right there was one of the best feelings I've ever experienced. You know, wow. beating him in Chicago and then qualifying for this, the Olympics that I'd been training for for eight years. And in them previous eight years, there'd only been two boxers ever to qualify now three boxes to ever to qualify for the Olympics from Great Britain. So it was really, really hard to qualify for the Olympics. Uh, so just to qualify was like, wow, like a weight off the shoulders. Yes, I'm, I'm going. And then obviously I went there and then to bring back that medal, it was like a, a unforgettable experience. You know, I've got a friend, Wayne McCulloch, who went to the Olympics like, 10 years before me or, or, or 12 years before me and he said uh, remember our, our baby shower he said to me he said uh, you know having a having a baby is the best feeling in the world I went better than winning the Olympic medal he went oh yeah it's better than I'm like wow he told me having a baby was better than winning the Olympic medal and I was like well the Olympic medal was the best thing ever and I couldn't believe it so I'm now I'm excited but having our first kid can't wait for it to come out <laughs> and in the hospital, I'm like, oh, this feeling, I, I'm, I'm ex excited to get it. Anyway, I have our kid, and I'm like, oh, it didn't compare to winning the Olympic medal. <laughs> I mean, having a kid was amazing. It was, I'm not, it was amazing, but, you know, there's, there's levels. <laughs> but our first kid was born it's with... It's different, yeah. It's different. It was born with complications. She, she, oh. she couldn't, couldn't breathe and all that, and she got rushed away. So I'm thinking, maybe that's what it was. So... 18 months later, our second kid come out, and I'm like, oh, this is it. This is this feeling I've been waiting for, and I come out like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wasn't disappointed, but it's like, you know. Tony, your wife is in the room. My wife's right there, like, going <laughs> to strangle me when we leave here. But, uh, no, I mean, having kids is great, but, yeah, yeah, we're talking about the best feeling ever. You know, I haven't, I haven't gone through eight years having surgery on my body multiple mm. times to different places. Uh, all the blood, sweat, tears, and disappointments, and depression—a bit, well, not much, much depressing, but feeling down and up. Like you said, the them roller coasters, yeah. thinking you're not going to get there. Then to to finally get that medal, it was like, yeah, unbelievable. Yeah, unbelievable. Well, we talked about that, the, the the unbelievable feeling, but you alluded to and mentioned the drinking afterwards. Yeah. So here's the best feeling in the world, and then it's re removed from you the opportunity to continue and probably to achieve even more. Right. Um, you know, you don't go from winning an Olympic bronze medal to thinking you're only going to have 10 fights. Um, which, which that's still a great career. Um, yeah. uh, undefeated. 
but then um, to not to not finish it on your terms, right? To not go out the way you want to go out, um, and then drinking began. So, what was that journey like? Yeah, that was hard, you know. And now after the after the Olympics, I was in my my area. I was very well known, I'm yeah. only Olympic medalist, or only Olympian from me full city ever. So I was always in the newspapers and like life changed and kind of would sound like a dick, a bit of a household name in, in in the area. Sure. And all my fights were live on TV, so I was very well well known. And then, you know what it's like—you having them massive highs when you when you're winning all the time, and then all of a sudden, I'm not fighting ever again. I'm not going to have these highs ever again. It's like, huh? Now what? What feels good is having having a, a bottle of wine. That felt really good and took me mind off everything. Not not I'm gonna. I'm not going to get them feelings again of, of boxing. Um, and I remember I had casts on my hands like this. My wife had to help Same us. time? Yeah. My mm. wife had to help us wipe my ass. Wow. <laughs> uh, she's a nurse, so it was, you're, it was you're easy a saint. for her. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and yeah, it, it was tough. And then, and then when you start drinking, I was in good shape when I was fighting. My body started to change and I started to put weight on. So that made you feel even worse. And. How old were you at this time? Twenty-seven. Yeah. Um, ten years ago. Yeah, or ten. 11? Yeah, ten years ago. So it, w- it was tough. It really was. But then we moved to America. Got away from England, where I was known. I come to, uh, to Los Angeles, and then I start teaching boxing. Got a job in a gym, and yeah, it was crazy. What What was crazy when I come to America? I'd never had a job interview in my life because I'd boxed forever. And we, I was like, I know I need a job now. What am I gonna do? So I applied for a job in 24 Hour Fitness. It was next to Beverly Hills. And I was really nervous. I had a shirt on and trousers. I was Googling how to do in- interviews and all that. And I put me Olympic medal in me bag. <laughs> there you go. And I was like, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's gonna get it. So I know, right? <laughs> just wear it in. <laughs> wear me Olympic medal yeah. and I'm like, hey, man. Underneath your shirt. <laughs> they just take your shirt off. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I get there and <clears throat> like my palms are really sweaty and I kiss Sarah outside. She's like, you, you, you'll be fine, you'll be fine. So I went in and then this manager who was interviewing us, he like, he had his feet on the desk and his hands behind his head like this. And I'm like, it's a bit weird. I'm, I'm like, hey, nice to meet you and all that. And I'm like, I would love to, you know, maybe help you with boxing, putting some boxing classes in, in, in the gym. It's like, oh. And he's like, let me see your resume. And I went, and I had a look. I had some personal training c- uh, certificates. And then I went, oh, I've also, I went to the Olympics and I, I won the Olympic medal. And I, and, I, and I pulled it out and I opened the box and he's there. And he's like, all right. And he's like, didn't give a shit. And I'm like, wow, wow. Olympic medals mustn't mean anything in America. I didn't know. <laughs> and I'm like, they do, that guy's just an <laughs> asshole. All right, yeah. And he's like, all right, yeah. And then I'm getting out and, and he's like, all right, cool, I'll be in touch. And he didn't even put his hand out to shake my hand. And I was like, really? Shake his hand. And I left and so I was like, well, how did it go? I went, oh, I, I don't know, I didn't think it went well. And then two weeks went by, I sent him an email. I was like, mate, I was just following up on, on, on this or we give the job to someone with more experience. And that, that was it. And I was like, wow. And then I was like, what the hell am I going to do with me with my life? I can't even get a job. Uh, people are not bothered about me background and all that. I must need to get more certifications and I don't know what I was going to do. But then I applied for a, a job in a gym in Santa Monica that was doing boxing fitness and straight away they're like, yes, we'll have you. Yeah, we'll let me box. So, you know, that's another crazy thing yeah. there. Uh, were you were you drinking at that time too? No, by, by this yeah. time I'd. I mean, I was drinking a little bit, but I wasn't like heavy on it like I was when I first retired. Yeah. Well, I think I think what you hit on there is like that moment of of self doubt. I mean, you come from any anywhere. Like if someone go moves from the U.S. to the U.K. or, or f- yeah, f- but anytime you move to a new place, you're excited to start a new life. And then all of a sudden something goes that way um, where a guy is arrogant, doesn't give you the time of day, doesn't even give you a notice. That, yeah. um, you didn't get the job, you're waiting for two weeks. Like right. that can cause it. I think that that can cause self-doubt to anybody, but someone with an Olympic medal, it, 
in one way it can even cause you to have doubt but maybe to you personally you might feel like well yeah it, of course it caused doubt because i have this accolade right, yeah. and they didn't even care yeah then uh, uh two years after after we opened our gym uh and in boxing burning Santa Monica, then we got named number one gym in california for men's fitness gym was booming tons of members so i sent that guy an email <laughs> <laughs> with with the link to the uh, California from one gym. <laughs> like, hey mate, remember you didn't give me that job when I wanted to put a boxing program in your in your gym. Uh, have a look on this link, you fucking asshole. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I sent it. Uh, he didn't respond. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he I, probably I, didn't have his job anymore. That I, I know that's yeah. what I was thinking. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I felt good to do that. Yeah. But yeah, like like we mentioned earlier on, you know, I could have quit then. I could have yeah. thought, oh, I'm got to jump on a building site like these other boxers. You could have gone back to drinking. Could have back drinking. Anything could could have happened, but you know, I, I didn't give up, and I went on to the next thing. And then from that gym that I, I started working in, two months later, I quit that gym, started doing a donation only boot camp uh, at the beach with Kevin Watson, my business partner, and started getting busy. And I was like, wow, I kept getting lots of members there. And then I, all of the money I made for boxing, which wasn't much, I had about thirty grand in the bank. I put that, all of that into an empty warehouse in Santa Monica. I'm like, I'm just putting it all in there and see what happens. And then that's how our gym started. And then 18 months later, we opened a second location. And then it just kind of went from there. Yeah. You know, and everything changed. Well, uh, we'll get back into the business side of things and then into YouTube and how you just exploded there and all the good things that are coming yeah. from it. Um, but I want to go back and see, do you... Do you think there are any specific tools, tactics, techniques um, that we can drill down into that helped you stop drinking? I, I mean, I had a great, a great wife and, and me, me family as well. Like, you know, they were there to support us. But I just feel like you can have the great people around you, but it's kind of on you to pull yeah. yourself out of that, that rut. And somehow I did it by, I think, focusing on something else because at the time I was focusing on I'm not going to box again I'm not going to get these highs again and that was the thing that was pulling us down right but as soon as I occupied my mind with something else and you know which is like I'm going to go into the fitness side of things mm. that kind of really helped pull us out of that rut and and really really changed everything do yeah you, do you think making such a big change in your <clears throat> in your location made a huge difference for you because like you had a good point earlier when you were talking about applying your drive from taking it from one thing and applying it to another in business and you had a point about like your identity has changed mm. so much and a lot of people can't make that leap and do you think like taking yourself out of the U the UK out of Great Britain and putting yourself in California was like just like shifted your mind and opened you up to yeah. like accepting a new identity for yourself that's a great question and i've never thought about it like that before and, and i think you're 100 percent right yeah that that did because if i was in the same surroundings it would have been harder to pull yourself out uh, like mentally mm -hmm. but when you put yourself somewhere else and it's kind of like a fresh start you draw a line under that kind of get that out of your mind and start somewhere else it was a uh, yeah I, I, th I think i definitely did why help. did you go there in the first place well when i was a professional boxer i I trained my last three fights in California, but I'll be back in the, back in the UK uh, living. So I'll be here for eight weeks in California, then back in the UK. And when we were out there, uh, my wife loved it. She was like, "Why don't we try and move out here?" And I was like, "Oh yeah, let, let's let's do that." So that's what we that's what we decided to do. We'll, we'll move out here, and it, it kind of worked well together. So mm -hmm. rather than being stuck in England, we I was retired out out here. Um, and then where were you training i was training in torrance i was training with a guy called tommy brooks i was in training camps with evander holyfield wow so we were side by side working together which was which was amazing <laughs> yeah. yeah uh yeah did and you never find the chunk of his ear Don't put it back <laughs> on. no i remember i was going to spar with him one time and i was nervous but excited but i had a cut on my eye that uh had scar tissue one that kept opening and i i, I missed the opportunity to spar with him yeah but uh that was it was great it's there. probably smart take your time uh, yeah. I mean, like it'll come it'll come again not not get that thing split yeah, open I, know. I i did have a question for you to go on with amy's because um 
So I don't, I don't know if you ever have been asked this, but for me, well, let me tell you my, a little bit about me. I'm an alcoholic and an addict, oh, wow. and I've been to treatment twice. And it, what I realized was not even the first time I went to treatment. It was the second time I went to treatment. And I'd shared with you, I just got a friend to go to treatment and worried about him. But uh, first time I went, I was looking at all the stuff I did. And I was like, but I could do this. I could do that. I could do this. Like, I can figure this out. And thinking like a fighter, like I've, I've fought this or I've overcome that. Like, I can do this. But the second time through, it kicked my ass so hard and I fell so far down. I mean, it got knocked down and there was like no way to stand up on my own that I realized I had to get coaching um, for the biggest fight of my life. Um, and I'd never sought that out. I wouldn't talk to people about it. I wouldn't open up about it. I wouldn't be real about it. Not, not just with other people, I wouldn't be real with myself about it. So they had this little evaluation thing and not evaluation, but they say there's three categories of drinkers. I wonder if you find yourself in either one of these. Um, the first one's like a moderate drinker, which means, and, and people can fluctuate throughout these, but a moderate drinker will, um, they can moderate, which means they drink, but with a, a fight coming up, they can stop. You know, with, uh, with a kid, they can stop, whatever. Like they can stop or moderate at any time. A heavy drinker, a moderate drinker can go to a heavy drinker, but a heavy drinker drinks heavily. Um, and, but with a big enough reason, um, an opportunity to move to America, uh, and start a new life or with the plea of a wife or children or uh, the threat of a job loss, like they can either stop or go from heavy drinking to moderating where they can have one or two and put it down. But for a guy like me, a real deal, uh, addict or alcoholic, when I have a substance, um, I react differently than anybody else or like most people. How do you react? Um, You're one, all in. To no end, yeah. One's all too in. many and a thousand is not enough. Right. And so um, there's a thing that they talk about with alcoholics and addicts being discontented. Discontent, I would say, is you're thirsty. Discontented is there's not enough water in this whole world to, to quench my thirst. Right. And so... A real alcoholic or addict can't really ever stop or moderate from outside people um, or for a change of location. Like I lived at the Olympic Training Center, then from there addiction started out of surgery, then I moved to Iowa, go to Iowa State with Kale Sanderson, Olympic gold medalist and stuff. Then, then from there I got, uh, you know, addiction started catching up with me again after the change of location and new goals and everything else. Then I got into fighting mm. and then I'm on the lower rungs but things are going good. And then it's like, you know what? I need to change the location again, move to Dallas. Um, then I get on the ultimate fight or Vegas. Then I get off the ultimate fight, then Colorado. And it was almost like I was doing the change of location, but it wouldn't stick right. because I really didn't have any help or a sober support network or anyone to really talk about it. Or I didn't have a tool belt of like different tools to uh, a type of meditation. I thought only fighting and exercise. And that would help me because I'd work it out and sweat yeah. it out and then everything else. But, for me, it had to go deeper than that. So I wonder if you felt if you're moderate, if you're a moderate drinker, a heavy drinker, or an yeah. actual real deal, because. Uh, I, I think more like the, the real deal. I, I, so when I was retiring from boxing, when I got forced to retire, I thought I was drinking a lot, but that was kind of to make us feel better. That's why I was drinking. And then we moved to America and I didn't stop drinking. I was still drinking, but now I was drinking for, for pleasure and for fun which I didn't think it was a problem. But then in 2017, 2018, 2019, I started drinking in the house. Uh, I have a glass of wine, I turn it into two glasses, I turn it into a bottle of wine. Again, I didn't think it was a problem. Like when I retired was a problem, this wasn't a problem, I thought. And then until I was start thinking, well, I'm, I'm drinking every night. In 2019, I was thinking, I'm drinking every single night, a bottle of wine, two bottles of wine. And I was putting weight on. I didn't look good. I seen pictures of myself. I was like, ugh. And then it was New Year's Eve, December 19, 2019. I'm like, I'm done with drinking. And right now, I haven't drank for two and a half years. Wow. So I've just, because maybe like yourself, I'm either in or I'm not in. Yeah. I can't, I can't have a glass of wine 
who, who has one What's glass of wine? Yeah. yeah, I want, I want a bottle. Right. I want to get, I want to get smashed. I want to, I want to, you know, keep my mind elsewhere. And obviously, that's not good for you. But that, that's like, you say, what's the point of having one glass of wine? So now it's just like all or nothing. And now I'm having nothing. And since I've, I don't have any alcohol at all now, my life's just went up. Yeah. Where a lot of people think, oh, how can, you, how can you live when not having a drink? Yeah, watch what happens when you, when you do. What you, what you are doing when you're not drinking alcohol is you're, you, you're living longer because now on a, just see on a on a Sunday morning, I'm not uh, rough for like a full day. I'm sure you've experienced this. I'm not oh, rough yeah. for a full day. So now I've just got that full day back. Yeah. Now I can work for two hours and be productive, which is only going to help us with my business and me, in my life. So since I've quit, not only has my business, my finances got better, me me life, me relationship with my family, more time for my kids, everything's got better. Fightfortheforgotten.org. You can go check out Fight for the Forgotten, the foundation that I started. It is my passion project. It is something that I love so much because of the people we get to help. We get to help the pygmy tribe who adopted me in help themselves. We say opportunity is greater than charity. Charity can be great, but opportunity is just always better. That's why we've drilled something like 80 water wells already providing over 30,000 people clean water. We've started sustainable farms, bought back over 3,000 acres of land for the people who originally owned it, put it in their name. We built 32 homes, and now we're about to start a health center, a school, and a marketplace. They're gonna have a maternity ward, a pediatrics unit, and a dental suite. You can join the Fight for the Forgotten Fight Club at fightfortheforgotten.org. We would love, love, love to invite you on this journey to join this fight arm in arm with us. Our fight club, it's a monthly giving club. You can give $5 or more a month and that empowers us to empower people. Thank you for being on this journey with us. I invite you to come along for the ride. It's been absolutely epic, putting love and compassion in action and fighting for people. Fightfortheforgotten.org, join our fight club. Do you not drink anymore? No, no, I'm coming up on, I'm only coming up on nine months sober. Right. So I had a, a big, um, a big fall and Amy actually helped. So really support me getting to, to treatment. It really wasn't an option for me with how things were going. But, um, yeah, for me, it, I, I thought when I, when I got out of treatment the first time, it was like, okay, it was oxycotton or oxycodone. And, um, I can't do that. Um, and I, it, I've had multiple surgeries, different things like that, and it's always an excuse. And doctors, we just write it, right? Yeah. And you can have three doctors giving me three different kinds and different wow. stuff. And so that was the big one. But then to try to get me off that, I would go on the medical marijuana maintenance program. And really, I would just turn that into oxy, basically, like, like or legal heroin. Right. Um, because what one person would use, like a vape cartridge, and they have for maybe like, they use it in a month or two months. I would have four or five of those in a day. Wow. Um, so every inhale right. was THC. Or, wow. um, but when I got out of treatment the first time, then I thought, see, this is the difference between, I think, someone that can use and someone that can't is, I thought psychedelics would cure me of my addiction. And for me, I'm the type that any mind altering substance, like, I'll abuse it and um, and I'll look at it as a magic pill or a magic potion to change the way I feel. And so I just went to all the different psychedelics because I do think it, psychedelics are, are very needed in certain ways um, for people with PTSD or childhood trauma or um, maybe depression, anxiety, different things like that to, to get outside of yourself. But for me, I would want to stay there. And yeah. it and so for... I think it's a danger zone when maybe doctors say, I don't even know if doctors actually say this, but a lot of people in the psychedelic space will say, this drug will cure your drug problem or it'll fix your drug problem. And for me, like another substance isn't gonna fix my substance abuse problem, is what I found through experience. I tried it all. (laughs) And and Amy says, at least, uh, you've told me before, at least you got that out of your system. (laughs) You you did try it so you don't have the question. 
Like I've done the ayahuasca, I've done the DMT, I've done the mushrooms, I've done the ketamine therapy guided by doctors. Right. Um, and I think I did have healing in profound ways from, from a lot of trauma. But the thing was, was like I could look at that, but then I couldn't stop the substance. And um, I mean, in some ways I'm really grateful for the experiences. In other ways, like I'm, I'm also grateful I can tell an addict who's thinking the psychedelics are going to cure them. That really is just a Band-Aid solution. Like what's important about psychedelics is if you do them, afterwards you do the deep work and you do some therapy or some integration or like apply the principles that you were taught during this, the, yeah, yeah. the trip or the psychedelic to then apply it to life. For me though, it couldn't stop. Like some of my deepest, darkest times were right after a big psychedelic experience, oh, wow. like an ayahuasca ceremony with like professionals and Navy SEALs and Hall of Famers and Super Bowl champs and different stuff like that. And all of them were able to leave and go back to normal life. But not me, I went to a deep, dark hole. Wow. Um, that's interesting. I was just talking to Aubrey Marcus yesterday about yeah. ayahuasca because mm -hmm. I think he's just done it recently. And it's something that I want to try, but now you're telling me this, I'm like, yeah. mm, maybe, maybe not. Well, I think there's, I think it's just something to consider. I, I wouldn't tell anyone, do, don't. Yeah. I would say my experience. And I think it can help a lot of people. Mm. But I think um, for a guy like me, it sounds like you were a drinker. Me, I was any substance. And so whenever I have a psychedelic, now, if I can't have that psychedelic because there's not ayahuasca everywhere, well, then I'll find something else. Right. Yeah. And uh, it kind of sets off this this allergy or this um, mental obsession that then now I go on a spree and I don't come out of that spree until I'm, a, I'm either broke financially or a broken person or have broken my heart, someone else's heart. Yeah. Then I come out of that and I make promises and I'm crying or emerging remorseful. But if I don't have like something like a, a transformative experience at, at like a treatment center or something. I'm so grateful for that. Now oh, I have wow. a moment. Now I have a moment and been like, oh, I did it right this time. So I always have that to go back to, but I never want to go back to it. Right. Now, now, like you, I'm, I'm in this stage where I'm sober. It's really good for me. I have the love of my life, a, a family I love, like purpose, my foundation, all that stuff. I had people that really went to war to get me to go. And now that I have, like, I'm not going to waste that opportunity. I'm just right. going to stay sober now for me. Yeah, that's great. And now it sounds like you you kind of realize what's going to keep you on the straight and narrow and what, yeah. what's not. So yeah. I think that's that's the big thing, realizing yourself, even though it does feel good for us in the time. Well, for me, especially drinking, you know, I did miss it a lot for the first year, but now I'm over that and I'll never do it ever again, you know, because of what you said, you know, it can, it can mess everything up. But the thing that I'm really um, kind of obsessed with now is brain health. Oh, nice. Trying yeah. to get my brain as sharp as it can be. I had 106 fights, being punched oh, in the yeah. head around 30 to 50,000 times. And obviously, it's had some effect on my brain. And now, drinking 30 up, to 50,000 yeah. headshots when I, probably the average people, you know, knows zero to five, right? Yeah. In their life. Yeah. I did the maths from the 106 fights. If I, if I spot 10 times for each one of them fights, six rounds and each one of them rounds got punched in the head that's i think i said between five and seven times that works out to 30 to fifty thousand times i've been punched in the head uh so obviously it, it could be totally off but it's whatever i've been punched in the head thousands and thousands of times so to think that that hasn't affected us i would be punch drunk you know and so i know it's had some sort of effect on my life now if i'm drinking wine every night or, or anything or, or taking weed or having something you know that might affect me brain i've got three young daughters now the last thing i want to do is not be able to remember their names when i'm mm. when i'm 50 years old so you know i've invested in like a hyperbaric chamber Good. i've got like i have to uh, eat the right organic foods and uh, i'm doing uh, nad I, I, everything i can do to help this brain I, i'll do it it's really great I've got two things for you just on that with, uh, I'll, I'll get into Dr. Daniel Amen, but he got me into hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Same. Do you know yeah. Dr. Amen? Not personally, okay. but I went to his clinic and yeah, they were the great. ones who recommended me. Yeah, That's awesome. Uh, he's my doctor and uh, I'm actually in one of his books and uh, oh, wow. we're going out to his foundation December 7th and he's done this podcast and show and right. he's an in incredible human being. But one of the things he told me that then got me to go to treatment 
was um, like alcohol and Xanax or like barbiturates or benzos. Those are the only two substances in the world that if you stop cold turkey, you can die um, because of the withdrawals are so bad, right. seizures, death. Um, but alcohol, it's so normalized in our culture, yeah. which I mean, I, I, I'm, there's no shame in that coming from me, but because uh, I've, I've drink more than probably most most anyone on here but uh <laughs> they're listening i but he he really woke me up whenever he said um alcohol unlike heroin or meth alcohol will liquefy every organ in your body like studies show that there's something called wet brain wet brain and it, only drinkers get it not meth addicts not heroin addicts but wet brain is something you just your your brain literally in many ways liquefies and it just never bounces wow. back from it. Wow. And so, and, and that's from repeated use over years or decades or whatever, but, um, but everyone's different and your tolerance is different. And some yeah. people get it much faster. Some people, it's a much longer process. Some people don't get it at all. Yeah. Um, I but think it was Dr. Eamon who said as well about marijuana yeah. that it slows down your brain receptors mm -hmm. and it takes up to 30 days for them to speed back up yep. again. And when I heard that, I might be totally wrong, but when I heard that, what well, might not have been him, I was like, I'm not, I'm not going to do any gummies ever again, and, yeah. and I didn't like the feeling of them anyway, because I want, I want to, I want to be sharp all the time. I don't yeah. want to be slowing down. Yeah. No. So that's the difference between you and me. No, I'm just kidding. I was <laughs> do you like, love the weed? Any of them? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. yeah uh, but it was, it was really anything that changed the way I feel. I would, I would fluctuate from liking this one to that one, uh, right. or I would try to escape one to another, and. Uh, so, but yeah, Dr. Amen, you, so you've had the brain scans? Yeah, I've done the brain scans yeah. and all that. And I'm this, supposed to go do my follow-up soon. Have you done your brain scans? Yes. Yeah, and did you find out the results? Yeah, More yeah. Uh, so I have the ring of fire, which uh, my brain lit up in a way that basically PTSD can be seen in the brain. So from the childhood bullying, but also I lived in Africa and I've been held at gunpoint. I've held a kid that oh, wow. died and I buried him and it was just some, some, some tough stuff. Taking rape, rape victims to the hospital after after uh, some very dark times. And um, so you can see the brain scan, the PTSD, the parts of my brain that are firing up. You can see that I have ADD. Um, but I'm grateful to say for a combat sports athlete or NFL player who said I had one of the best brains that That's with, with not a ton of brain trauma. Yeah. And um, But hyperbaric oxygen therapy, I've done probably 80 dives uh -huh. um, in the medical centers that they can take you deeper and stay yeah. there longer. Um, that's great. And supplements and everything else, change of, of diet and getting more sleep. Yeah, yeah, sleep's huge. Uh, yeah, that I went and I bought a hyperbaric chamber. It was expensive, but I've got one at home now. And because my results was lack of blood flow to the, yeah. to the front part of the brain. And that's off the... Yeah, that was brain. my frontal lobe. Yeah. And I'm also part of a brain study at the... Um, Cleveland Clinic in Las Vegas, where the, the study fighters brains, wow. and they've told me I've got a, a huge, huge. He said, split in my membrane, which is hmm. the part of, it's where the, what attaches the brain to the skull, and they said that's off being punched, and then your brain shook and it's, and it's split, uh, and he said that's pretty common with fighters, and there's no evidence that it affects you in everyday life, but having a split in something in your brain, obviously it's not good, so. When I heard that, I was like, oh, I can't be, I can't be drinking all the time. Yeah. You no. Know? Uh, so yeah, I'm doing everything I can to to keep, stay sharp as I can, which is a, uh, you know, because I, I do think that it's affected us a lot because of memory. I I forget things quite often. Uh, my wife says, you know, because I'm busy, I've got multiple businesses and, and lots of shit going on. But I, I, every time I forget something, I'm like, is this because I'm getting a bit punch drunk or not? You know? Do you, how's your memory? Amy, how's my memory? Your memory is uh, staggeringly good. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, you Thank have you. an excellent memory. It always you. surprises yeah. me. Yeah. Oh, well, that actually, Dr. Amon, or you, you were saying something. You might be better at long term than short term. Yes. Well, actually, that's what Dr. Amon said was mm -hmm. uh, for long term memory. Did, oh, did you do the test where they showed you the people's facial recognition or like this guy would be smiling this woman yeah. would be frowning this person would be laughing different stuff um they did that on me and then they came back and did it again because they didn't believe that i got a hundred percent wow um and so 
I, I remember a face. I remember everything about it. I got a hundred percent. And so I did it again and a hundred percent again. Wow. Um, and did you get concussed or knocked out or much? Or I, I've never been knocked out in a fight. Um, I got a big old heavyweight's head and, uh, <laughs> but that I, I'm also a wrestler. So I think maybe we can talk about this for a moment because I think a good thing about the sport of MMA is that, and it's just a newer sport. And I think they made some right moves in it. And I think they were doing it so it wouldn't look as barbaric or uh, modern day gladiator or human cockfighting as some of the US politicians were calling it. Um, but in MMA, if you get rocked and they come in to finish you, the ref has to step in to, to separate you, right? To basically save you from, right. from taking further damage and you're not intelligently defending yourself. I think one of the tough things, because I remember being a kid and I watched this fight between, you might know the fight, but it was on UFC, or sorry, uh, ESPN, uh, like fight fight night. And it was like one of their Hall of Fame fights of like, um, so, or Friday night fights. It was like one of the best ones ever. And it was an Italian heavyweight versus like a German heavyweight. And it's older, maybe the 70s, 80s, maybe the 90s, but... Um, during the 10 or 12 round fight, one guy got knocked down six times, the other got knocked down seven times. Wow. And it was just this back and forth war. But now me having fight experience, and I've been rocked one time in the gym. Uh, didn't get knocked out, but saw black, and then I decided, you know, I don't have a fight coming up, I'm gonna take some time off from sparring. Um, and that's really the only time I've had a flash. Wow. Um, and I'm grateful for that. But it's because if I get hit and a guy's doing a barrage of punches, like I'm a wrestler so I can take you down. I can grab you, I can hold. Right. But in boxing, if you're rocked and you go to grab, the ref jumps in to separate yeah, you. Right. Well, you're probably grabbing because you just got hit really yeah. hard or you're taking a break or whatever. But in fighting, it's a strategy. So now I'm, I'm not just protecting myself, I'm also working for a takedown to change the position. And then the ref will step in to do that. But I remember watching that fight and I was so excited. Uh, it made me fall in love with fighting even more. Right. But then after I started fighting, somehow I saw that fight again. And then I got a little bit of like knots in my stomach because I was like, dude, this guy's rocked. He's concussed. Yeah. And he's down and now he gets eight, 10 seconds to stand back up. Right. Then he, incredible comeback. He knocks the other guy down. But now he's maybe concussed. And now he stands back up and they, they do it back and forth, back and yeah. forth, back and forth. So. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, there was one fight that went back in the, I'm talking about back in, I think it was 1870, that went 170 rounds or something like that. Back then they just kept on going. And was that, uh, I don't know if it was bare knuckle, but was that here in the US? Yeah. I think it was in uh, Hattiesburg, or Her uh, Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Uh, one of the fighters I think was named Sully. Um, uh, Amy, could you look this up? Uh, no. Sully and uh, longest boxing fight yeah. in the Mississippi. Okay. Because uh, my grandfather, before he passed away, and my uncle, um, they were really excited because uh, they had just moved to a different part of Mississippi. They're like, we're going to Sully's. And uh, I think it's Sully's. And we went there. And then afterwards, the owner said, hey, I got to take you somewhere. And he took me to the landmark of where the actual fight happened. Wow. And there were some pictures of it all <laughs> in the bar and the restaurant. And how many rounds was it? Can you tell us what it um, was? 75. <laughs> it was, oh, was Sullivan time? and challenger Jake Kilrain, and it was near Hattiesburg on July 8, 1889, at the farm of Charles Rich. And Sullivan won the fight, which lasted 75 rounds. It was over two hours and 18 minutes. Two hours and 18 minutes. minutes. <laughs> there, there's probably another one. Yeah. Maybe this was the, I think this was the last. Draw. Uh, it says, it says the, Sullivan won the fight, but yeah, is there another so one? I'm, I'm getting it wrong because... This was the last bare knuckle boxing fight. Right. Oh, okay. Um, until uh, gloves, and now there's bare knuckle again. Yeah. So that was the last bare knuckle. Right. And it was the longest bare knuckle, I think. Yeah. Uh, but you might be. I've just right, done a video longest. on it with uh, talking about it, and I think, it, I think maybe the, the longest boxing fight ever. One. one well, the longest seven. bare knuckle ever was six hours and fifteen yeah. minutes. And that one ended in a draw. Yeah. Because the both. Is it, can you say that one? Yeah. Because the both that. like refused to come out for like the hundred and something round. Yeah. <laughs> Is there any information on that? 
but you're still talking about a bear, no, the bare knuckle one. Yeah, but yeah, we're talking just longest. That one, the record over. one that was six hours, it was James Kelly versus Jonathan Smith in right. Australia. Oh. So that was 17 rounds, it says. 17 so, mm-hmm. two, two hours each round. Mm-hmm. No, uh, we'll, <laughs> yeah. we'll find that out. Yeah. If you find it uh, with like longest boxing fight ever. Yeah, uh, I maybe like hundreds of rounds. Boxing I, fight video ever? I, I done a video yeah. on talking about the, the old style boxing stance yeah. compared to the new style. And they did it because back then, when when they, they started this, this was before uh, the Queensbury Boxing Rules, they, uh, they were allowed to eye gouge and grapple wow. in, the, in these fights as well. And they were bare, they were bare knuckle, they didn't have gloves on. And they used to, you know, try not to hit in the head or to damage the hands. They try to hit in, yep. the, in the in the body more or mm-hmm. on the cheeks. You really had to pick your shots, I guess. Yeah, which is crazy. Yeah. Imagine trying to fight with, with, I mean, especially me, with with no gloves on, and then never even more mouthpieces. Mouthpieces mm-hmm. didn't come in, I think, until uh, until like eighteen ninety five or something like that. You know, they didn't wear mouthpieces. They used to get the teeth knocked yeah. out. Yeah. Well, I, I was, my first couple fights, um, first two were in Oklahoma, and my third one, this was kind of back in the day, but I showed up to a pro fight in um, Iowa, and I'm in the crowd, I'm 19 years old, uh, and someone didn't show up, they weighed in, but they didn't show up fight night, so the promoter's in there, apologizing to this guy's fans, the guy gets on the microphone and says that there happens to be a pro fighter here, over 205 pounds, and uh, you want to fight, like, I came here to fight. And uh, my friend looks at me, what are you thinking? He doesn't know anything about fighting. I'm wearing, like, jeans, a button-down shirt. I don't have anything with me, no no gloves, no mouthpiece, no cup, no anything. And uh, and I'm on my third beer. I had a fake ID. And uh, so I just finished that, and uh, I stood up and raised my hand, and uh, we used a boil-and-bite mouthpiece in a <laughs> coffee pot. Um, wow. Like so, I had coffee breath uh, from taking the fight. But the reason I say that was there's another How did you get fighter. On? Uh, it was my shortest fight I think I've had. It was like I don't know. You won. Uh, yeah, I won. Wow. Yeah, and he was a wrestler. He had cauliflower ears, but I knew I was a better wrestler, so I was just gonna wait for him to shoot in and and try to catch him with an uppercut. And yeah. some reason it worked. Led with my left leg. He went to shoot in on it, and I caught him with an uppercut, and then TKO finished him up. Wow. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I was ready to fight. Like a young, ready to prove myself. I chose fighting because it was like, if I could be one of those guys, I won't be bullied anymore. So for me, it was changing my identity from right, like yeah. bullied kid to never be bullied again. Yeah. Um, so I was ready to stand up for that. <laughs> uh, did you find it? Longest one? I think don't so. Oh, I, don't, um, I have this one that was a draw yeah. and it was seven hours, 19 minutes. Yeah, wow. that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, that's the one you're thinking What's of. What's the names? Yeah. In 1893, it was Jack Burke and Andy Bowen. Yeah, that's the one I'm thinking about. Yeah. yeah. Can you imagine fighting seven It went till 4 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> went till 4 a.m. <laughs> yeah. They're the main event and everybody else is like, I wonder how many people actually stayed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm all right. <laughs> Wait, I'm leaving. It's getting boring. A- Amy and I are going to a uh, uh, a match on Sunday, and it's between um, Felipe Pena and Gordon Ryan. And Gordon, oh, yeah. Yeah. Gordon's a training part. Or I'm one of Gordon's training partners. We're on the same team now. Oh wow! And he's five-time world champion. Uh, they're calling him the greatest of all times. And Pena's the last guy to beat him. That was over five years ago, and it was whenever Gordon was just a, a black first becoming a black belt, and so he gets redemption. But uh, they decided that they were going to do a submission only, no time limit. Uh, That's what they're doing. Yeah. Wow. Sunday. So Amazing. this could go till 4 a.m. And Amy <laughs> hopes it doesn't. She's looking at her face. <laughs> How do you get on with Gordon Ryan training? Uh, really? I mean, well, I, it's great to be with the greatest. And um, so I'm learning what, a lot. What's he like? Are you, like, like training-wise? Is he unbelievable? Training-wise, he, well, yeah, he's unbelievable. He's, he's unlike anyone in the room. Right. Um, but I think styles make matchups, and I think he really likes training with me because I come from the wrestling background. Right. He's got a lot of jiu-jitsu guys in there, and he has actually really good wrestling for a jiu-jitsu guy. Uh, deceptively good and um, it's hard to take him down he can get takedowns um, but styles make matchups and because I'm big strong me on top I think I, I give him good work right. and uh, and but whenever he's on top and I'm a wrestler and I'm not good on my back or I'm, I'm good on my back but not against that level you submit you pretty fast. Um, he submitted me a couple times and uh, and but I also don't know if he's actually like turned it up like right, competition yeah. level but um, I think I think it's been a great place for me to train. 
normally you don't really have mat talk off the mats, but uh, oh, really? yeah. but I've been I've been catching and surprising some guys in there that are that are black belts and world class and yeah. stuff like that. And so I'm happy to be there. I think they're happy to have me there. And John Danaher um, is, I'll just say that the way that it's going is they believe, I believe, and it's it's really good to feel like in line with that, that any heavyweight I put on the mat, I'm gonna finish. That's great. I'm gonna submit or I'm gonna knock out. Yeah. And uh, yeah. so anyone in the world. Wow, yeah, Gordon Ryan stood me. Yeah, he's such a stud. It, it's, it's like a, a what is it? He's so brilliant. He's really smart, but he's also super humble. Really? And you don't expect that from like following him online and stuff like that, but yeah. he's so generous with his time. He's come to support the nonprofit and uh, oh, um, Sonny's been really generous and they've just been, they've been incredible, man. Yeah. Uh, they're always willing to help. When is and that teach fight? at Sunday night. Sunday night? In Dallas. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's, it's sold out. It's it's gonna be yeah. I'll send you a link or at least the results afterwards. Yeah, send me the link. It's it's gonna be great. That would be awesome. Yeah, yeah. But seven hours. What's the longest time you've <laughs> span of what you've actually fought? Seven hours. That's that's my. I I did eight rounds. That was me. Uh, me last few professional fights was the longest one. I had a really bad experience in me in me seventh professional fight, um, where which really made me fall out of love out of love with boxing. <clears throat> So I was fighting my first eight round fight and I was nervous about it. In the training camp, it was like six weeks before the fight, I pulled a muscle in my arm, my, my bicep, which mean I couldn't spar for the fight. So I called my promoter, I went, listen, I'm, I'm gonna have to pull out this fight. I can't spar, first eight round fight. I, 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 don't, I don't wanna do it. And he's like, oh, but we need you, we fight, we fight. you're gonna be fighting in your area. We will need you for the card. You need to sell the tickets, We've got, it's on TV. I was like, yeah, but I'm not risking anything. I've got to pull the muscle in my arm. I'm not, I'm not doing it. Said, oh, you'll, you'll beat this guy, you'll beat this guy. I said, okay, we'll put the fight down to six rounds. Will you fight then? And I'm like, oh, all right, I'll do it six rounds. I'll get through six rounds. I said, oh, great. So I'm fighting the six round fight. It comes, to, comes to fight night, gets in the ring. I'm fighting this tough guy. After the six rounds, because we the, the, the referee scores the fight at this level of boxing, mm. so not, not the judges. So after the sixth round, I put everything into the sixth round. I'm exhausted. Go to the referee from to raise my hand. The referee says, you've got two more rounds left. Whoa. Like, what? The fucking promoter light was to get us into the ring. So I cook up back in my corner and I'm exhausted. And then me, 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 me trainer's like, what are you? No, no, this is a six round fight. What are you talking about? And I'm sat down and I'm like, <sighs> exhausted. And I'm like, what's going on here? I didn't know what was going on. And it's kind of like, if you've, if you've, done a run and you've run a six mile race and then the last mile, you put everything into mm -hmm. it. You empty the tank. Empty the tank. And then it's like, oh, come on, you've got two more mile left. Like, oh, I can't, I can't do it. So the last two rounds, I, I go out and, and do the fight. I got beat up the last two rounds and the fight ended up a draw. It's me, it's, I think seven professional fight. And I come up the ring, I was on the ground, exhausted, couldn't move, thrown up. I uh, was going to go to the emergency room because, you know, and that right there was the worst experience I've had with boxing. And it made us fall out of love with boxing. The promoter was like, oh, I, I didn't know what, like bullshitting. Yeah. Uh, Do you think he was trying to get the other guy to win? Set you I, up? I, I don't know if you, you he just wanted me to, to fight because I was the big ticket seller, yeah. the big name on the card. And without me, he wouldn't sell the tickets. He wouldn't make the money. He thought I was just probably gonna knock this guy out because I'd knocked most of my guys out. And it was just sneaky. And yeah. yeah. I didn't know if, you thought it was a six round and he knew it was an eight round, your opponent and- um, My opponent knew it so was he, eight round. So he yeah. he let you pour it all out in the sixth round. The reason I'm saying that is my third or fourth pro fight, I fought at American Airlines in Dallas. I was the ticket seller because I'm from Dallas um, and I'm undefeated, but I'm fighting this guy from California, but it was a last minute opponent change. I didn't know about it um, until three or four days before the fight. Wow. They said my guy got injured. The other guy I found out afterwards knew about me his entire camp, wow. eight, 10, 12 weeks. No. Um, and it was very deceptive. Like I had, I had signed a contract with another name, all this other stuff. Then all of a sudden fight week, they're giving me another contract with another name. So there wasn't much on this guy. And what I found out was he, uh, they basically tried to strip all of his fight stuff from YouTube or his, his content at least and things. Um, and they told me he was a, 
a jiu-jitsu guy only, that he was really good in California, that he was this level belt and all this stuff, but I was a wrestler. So all of a sudden my corner went from take him down, beat him up for the original opponent, who I thought was a, a mostly a striker and, and a little bit of jujitsu. So now I'm thinking he's only jujitsu. I better stand and bang with this guy. And it's early on in my career. I don't really have much boxing and yeah. striking uh, experience. So I stay standing with him and uh, for the first round. And I mean, it, we went back and forth, but I remember in the first 10, 20 seconds, he broke my nose. And I'm like, whoa, after the first round, this is early in my career. I wasn't truly listening to my corner men. In fact, I had another corner man I didn't really know and some things. And so I wasn't in tune with their voice. I didn't know them intimately. So after the first round, they're like, this guy's not a jujitsu guy. This guy is a high level striker. And I'm like, oh shit, it feels like that. Yeah. And they're like, take him down, beat him up. So I went back in, took him down. And I think he little, it was less than two minutes. Um, wow. Took him down, ground and pounded him out. After the fight, he said, we almost got you. And I'm like, what? And you know, you, you, you normally become friends with your opponents yeah. afterwards, or there's this uh, bond you have because you know him like yeah. unlike anyone else. And, uh, but found out the promoter and him were friends that this guy had been a Golden Gloves champion boxer, had been a pro boxer, had wow. all this stuff, and had some some wrestling background, had been like uh, second in state, um, so he could keep, try to keep it on his feet to then knock you out. Yeah. And so they set crazy. me up completely with wow. that. So it's it's crazy. What what other shady stuff have you had happen in boxing? Yeah. It's like that, um, I know they'll say, you, they pay you something and then all of a sudden they don't. Yeah, it's crazy. I remember one time, I used, when I was professional, I got 12,000 pounds for a fight. That's when, we, when I was getting paid. When I fought outside of my home city, when I fought inside of my home city, I got 20,000 pounds, which is about, I think 12,000 is about $18,000 and 20, 000, is about $30,000. And because I sold a ton of tickets. And so one of my fights was supposed to be in the very city center and they couldn't do it. So they, they did it at a different venue. So I had me fight and uh, I sent me invoice in for, uh, for, for 20,000 pound. And he went, oh, you know what, Tony, we checked the zip code and it was just outside the the arena was just outside of the zip code. So here's your twelve thousand. So I got like basically ripped off with eight thousand. Like little things, like well, not yeah. little things for for me. That's a lot of money. Yeah, for sure. And and things like that really uh, happened often. Like you see, what's messed up about professional boxing at like a low level, but even though it was live on TV, it's not that professional. I was kind of the A side all the time in my fights, and I trained in the same gloves that I fought in. I would, mm. I would, I would bring the gloves, and no one would check the gloves. I would be training them for. I fought in the same gloves like three times in a row, blasting every bags with them for, for my full camp, and it was a bit crazy. Then I would give me opponents a brand new set of gloves that I'd never been worn in before, so I had that advantage on them. Yeah. It was one time I got on the on the skills, and. Promoter was like the people that don't know that are listening. Like your gloves are broken in and theirs aren't yet. Exactly, yeah. yeah. But more than broken in, the wall wore yeah. down, which they're gonna fill your knuckles. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Which is, I mean, for me it was fine, but for for them it's 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 not fair. It's it's not. And I admit that. I got in the skills one time and me promoter told the guy who was supposed to be checking the skills me weight and he knocked like two pound off. It didn't make a difference. But like I was thinking, wow, he, he can just do that and knock weight off what I really weighed, <laughs> you know, it's crazy shit. Yeah. Crazy shit. Yeah. Well, going into your career now in YouTube and being an educator uh, for, it, it seems like all through your story and from watching you, you're a guy that gets to pursue your passion with purpose. Like you've found your reason and yeah. maybe you can speak to this because I think oftentimes in a fight, it's, and I've said this before too, but it's, it's, it's the person with the most reasons that usually wins. Right. But now you're taking those reasons into being an entrepreneur and an educator and, and even an entertainer. Right. Um, and so how are you doing that on YouTube? And, and uh, we'll plug it at the end too, but how, how can people follow you there? And what's, what's kind of your mission, your vision 
with educating people yeah. in boxing? I first posted a boxing education video on Instagram a good few years ago now. And I remember it was like, the, the it was a, a trick. It was like, if you, if you hit jab in the body, keep jabbing the body, then feet in the body, then come up with a full hook, and then the two. Uh, and it was like this tip that I thought like I used to do all the time and it was like a secret tip and you know with fighters we've all got our little secret strategies that work and I was like I don't think I should post this video because it's like my my thing where I teach people this was before I'd done any education videos and people might copy it and all that and I thought oh, I'll post it and see what happens so I posted this video and it blew up on Instagram I was getting loads of views loads of comments this is amazing but then like Four days later, there was a gym down the street from us in Santa Monica. One of their trainers must have seen it and seen that it was getting doing well. And he did the exact same thing, Cop like copied me move. And I was like, oh, someone's copied me move. I can't believe it. Oh, no. And I, at that point there, I was going to stop doing it. I was thinking, I can't give any more tips because people's copying my moves. Obviously, it's not my move, but probably thousands of coaches know it. Um, so I nearly stopped doing it. But then I thought, no, I'm going to post another one, post another one. And then I'm getting DMs off people saying, Tony, this is really happening. That's amazing. Please keep posting. So I post more and more. And now I'm seeing these messages coming in and I'm making, having an impact on people's lives. I'm like, shit, this is, this is really good here. And then at the same time, the following's starting to grow, getting more likes and stuff. And then... It's like, wow. And when you get lots of likes and stuff, it makes you feel good as well and comments. And this was it. I start just blasting content out there. Then my Instagram kind of kind of grew to, I don't know, like 100,000 followers or something, or 200,000 followers. And in 2020, when the shit at the fan and everything closed down, my gym got closed down, I was like, ah. Oh, I knew new YouTube of a platform was a huge platform, but it's so hard to, to break. And I felt like it was so hard to build on there. I used to always focus my time and energy on on Instagram. And then in 2020, when the gyms closed down, I went to the gym and I started shooting content. And I, start, I thought, I'm going to build me YouTube. I'm going to really, really build YouTube and help people on there as well. And I just started posting. And I, I hired a YouTube manager. didn't work. I was investing money into, into getting help. It wasn't working. I was ed editing all the videos myself. And then one video that I shot on my iPhone started getting lots of traction and it got like 100,000 views and my subscribers were going up and I was like, wow. And that was kind of the start of everything. And since then, like my life's, my life's changed. So when a lot of people during 2020 and everything was closed down, stopped at home, and start a lot. Some people are feeling sorry for themselves, and my business is closed down. What do I do? I, I went the opposite way. I hired a, a marketing manager for my online education program, like our certification, uh, where lots of companies were getting rid of the marketing people because mm. it was they weren't doing well. I went the opposite way. I went against the grain, and I focused fully on putting content out and. And promoting and so many people i think during covid um i'm friends with century martial arts okay and, yeah uh, i actually just found out last week i'm about to be on the cover of black belt magazine oh wow um and uh they've they've been great century now owns black belt magazine and some different things but they uh they used to have thousands of products and now they've like gone down to like a hundred or less because with covid so many things have exploded but bags yeah, gloves, at home bags. Yeah. Like at home bags because people aren't, people want to box at home now. Right, yeah. And yeah, I remember Century, we, I was speaking to them because our gym got closed down. We were like thinking the ideas, how can we help people at home? We need to get them bags delivered. So we, we were going to go for that route, but it ended up too expensive. We, we never did it. Uh, so I was helping people online and people were sitting at home watching videos and and that's kind of where everything changed and, and the YouTube started to, to blow up. And it's really changed everything in my life now. I want to get into that and what specifically it's changed. But before that, what what's a video or two you would suggest people going if they're going to go to your channel? And I hope they'll subscribe and check it out because I know yeah. this is very beneficial content. But what would be a video or two like the, a starting point for yeah, them to I've go check out? Yeah, I've got a video out? called uh, what's it called the Ultimate Guide to Boxing, 
and the ultimate guide to boxing. Yeah, if you if you type in how to box on YouTube now, uh, my video comes up. I think I think ultimate boxing tutorial. Yeah, if you type in how to box, it's like number one or number two on on, on there, which is nice. amazing. Wow, and it's a fifty-five minute video, but I've I've created into sections how to get your stance, how to move your feet, how to throw a jab, how to throw a cross, and really broke it down. And this is. Yeah, that's one, one of the best videos I've ever done, and uh, it's it's helped. And it's out there for free for people. Out there for free. Uh, but then, business wise, do you get something back from putting it out there? For yeah. Free? So, what happens is, I get paid per v- when people view the video. It's the money that you make from it. It's like thirty dollars for every hundred thousand views. Oh no! Thou- every ten thousand views, I get like thirty dollars. So, the goal is to get like hundreds of thousand views every single day, and then th- from that revenue, you know, uh, at the end of the month, you've got a you've got a nice, a nice little, uh, nice little payment payout. But then more people subscribe, the more views you get, and then, and then obviously sponsors are like, wow, this guy's getting lots of uh, views. We want to be involved, and then. Sponsors reach out and and then like what I'm talking about, it's changed my life. Now I'm earning more money off YouTube a month than I was earning in my professional boxing career, which is unbelievable, you know, yeah. un- unbelievable. And, I, and I, yeah, I'm, I'm blown away because I'm doing something that I absolutely love to do, which is help people with boxing and create content because I'm a creative person. And now I'm getting rewarded for it which is which is helping me and, and my family big time that's incredible how would you say you say you're a creative person how important is it from fighting to be creative do you, would you say you were that's always who you were like you were you were a creative fighter and then have you gotten more creative or do you just found a different outlet for yeah. it through i mean with with fighting uh i wouldn't i wouldn't say i was super creative i was just really good at the basics the basic straight punches and 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 the footwork uh you know, I, I guess I guess it is. It is. You've got to be creative in there when you're fighting different styles and all that. Uh, but but now in the in the media world, I've, I've always been creative that way. You know, even when well, I've seen you even get creative whenever uh, um, lots of your videos, you make it just relatable, or you speak like anyone's language to understand boxing. Whenever sometimes like it can seem like you're speaking a different language if that makes sense yeah. but like if you're not if you're speaking the pro language maybe the average joe doesn't understand it but right but you make it to where anyone can understand yeah it. but then i think you've been really creative in a good way where like whether it's i forget if it's logan paul or jake paul like you've done breakdowns of right, that yeah. because um some people love those guys some people hate those guys but at least they're their their influence is benefiting combat sports yeah and so is. I've liked your take on it and also like your breakdowns of it. So that way, um, I think that's helping you. It's helping the sport. It's helping everything. Yeah. Yeah. It's getting more eyeballs on the sport for sure. Uh, and as for, as for the, the simplifying it, it was, I think it was Albert Einstein who said, uh, a genius is not a person who gets something that is simple and makes it complicated, but a genius is a person who gets something that is complicated and makes it sound simple. There you go. No, I'm not saying I'm a genius. You're a genius <laughs> no, <though. laughs> I didn't mean I'm a genius. But what I try to do, I try to simplify everything and make make it for a if a if an eight year old can understand it, anyone can understand it. Where I see other people who's doing education stuff out there, whether it is boxing or or, or maybe jujitsu or or whatever it might be, and they're making things really complicated and mm. the the teaching in a way where it makes them might sound like they're really clever and using these really long words and but it's not relatable to everyone well, i just simplify the shit out of it and yeah you know just, just speak how it is well i'll bring up gordon ryan again real quick and john danaher because um you simplifying things i think i in wrestling i would i would coach but in my professional career i've gotten out of like coaching a lot but i also have other things going like the nonprofit and but Gordon and John, they have tutorials and they teach class every day and all this stuff. And they just are, I think it's so important to teach what you're learning because then it's ingrained in you even yeah. more. So I wonder if you compared like your boxing knowledge to whenever you were at the peak of your career, 
to the boxing knowledge you have now. Maybe your body's different right. and, and father time's caught up a little bit, but what do you think yourself now with the knowledge you have for boxing would actually beat the yourself at yeah, time? Yeah, I've got way more knowledge now after coaching this than I did when I was fighting. I'm understanding a lot more. And I, I, th I think, you know, when, like what you said, when you, when you do coach it, you see a different side of it. Mm. So my knowledge now was way more than when I was fighting through coaching it and really thinking about it. When I was fighting, I, I used to just do it and listen to coaches, but didn't think of the reason, well, why? If I do this, will he do that? And then I can do this. But now I'm coaching and I'm thinking about it more. I've got a way better understanding of it. Way better understanding of, of the sport. And obviously when I was fighting, I, I couldn't I couldn't be coaching the way I am now. With Gordon Ryan, I, with Gordon Ryan, I think it might be a little bit different out with his time spent and all that. It's It's... I mean, he's in the gym two or three times a day, but he's teaching and training at the same time. Right, or yeah. he's listening to John, and then John will bring him in to teach how he does this in a certain practical way, like from this match. And it's actually a really unique relationship because um, my first or my last coach in, in jiu-jitsu, Rafael Lovato Jr., is the best American to ever do it for the most part, or uh, most accomplished until Gordon, and um, like a six-time world champion, different things like that. But I haven't seen the relationship side of it where John has coached Ryan since he was young. Now he's five-time world champion, like consecutively, just boom, 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 stacking it up. They say it's literally like John is playing a video game out there. Wow. He'll almost whisper, like, do this with your right arm or call out this move or whatever it is. And Gordon just boom, reacts, boom, reacts, boom, reacts just because they've drilled it so many times in the room, yeah. and he's heard it so many times there, and he already knows the breakdown and the system and the fundamentals and the process, and and he's eight, 10 steps ahead of everyone. Yeah, that's amazing. But really it's literally like level. he's pushing a button on a controller. <laughs> really, really high level stuff, yeah. and that's why they're the best in the world, right? Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. What, you said something earlier, and I definitely wanna hit on that before we wrap up, because you said you're getting comments or messages from people that are saying how your videos have impacted their life. Yeah. Do any of those stand out to you specifically? Why and 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 what does that mean to you? Yeah. Well, it's it's everyone has got different struggles with with, with boxing. It might be people for fitness. It might be people who's actually professional fighters. I, I get comments from everyone, uh, like. Every time we go away with the kids to a theme park, there's normally men who's in their 50s or 60s come up like, hey, I watch your videos and give me fist pumps and all that, which I'm always That's like surprised awesome. at. Yeah. And then we were just in Miami uh, a couple of weeks ago, went in a, a Fifth Street gym there and all the fighters went, wow, Tony, these are professional fighters. Your videos are amazing, they're helping me so much. And I'm kind of blown away from it. So it's it's kind of different people from, from different, uh, aspects of life, they're getting value from it in different ways. It might be the same video, but they might learn something different to what, what this guy learned. Uh, but overall, the, the, the comments I'm getting, it's it's unbelievable and it's it's kind of, uh, it's blown away. But it's got to the point now where I've got, I, I get that many, getting thousands of comments out every single day. I can't, can't read them all, right. which, is, which is hard. I want to, yeah. but I also get lots of messages about Tony, can you tell me how to do this? And at first, when I told you about when I started on Instagram and I posted that faint the jab, hook the head to a video, people would say, Tony, I, I need to work on this move. And I would I would sit there for ages, I would respond, telling them how to do it. Then I'd get another one and I'd, be, I'd spend hours just responding to DMs, giving people all this advice. And I was like, why didn't I just keep making videos on this? Mm. And, then, and then it clicked like, I'm spending so much time on this, I need to make money. So I created a video package where all of these questions, I answered them all. So then I was like, yeah, I can answer your question, but I've created videos for it, it's in this package. And then, you know, it's rewarding me for, for me time as well. Right. Um, so, yeah. Which is good, because you're providing a value. Providing a value. And so and I, it's that energetic exchange of you poured your energy out and and they can give something in return for yeah. that. So it's a good thing. You can thing. get everything for free on, on YouTube, right. but if you want to, you, you know, get it, have it all in one place, 
it's it's in, in my video packages as which well. Which is where the, where can they find that? That's it's called masterboxing.com. Uh but yeah, you can get like I see you can get everything for free on on YouTube, right. all of the videos and, and all that stuff. Uh but people, you know, they like to come and, and support us for all of the help I've given them as well. Yeah. Which is which is amazing. Well let me ask you this. What is your intention or your hope for the impact? So there's there's maybe soccer moms to high level pro athletes that are watching your videos. Right. But if you had to sum it up into what you intend or how you want to impact each viewer, how would you say that? So I'm pivoting a little bit. I help people on, on online, people at, at home, but I want to help people in person. So my goal now and my business goal is we've created a thing. It's called Connect, Connect by Tony Jeffries. And we want to connect people with boxing by helping business owners like Jeffy Meadows, for example, or anyone who owns Anyone who owns a business, a, a gym, anywhere in the world, we want to help them put boxing into their gyms. Mm. So what we've been creating for the last two years is we've done pro we've programmed classes that they can play in the gym. We can educate the trainers on how to teach these classes. It's like a turnkey solution to adding boxing to any gym in the world. And so far, we've done a soft launch. We're in nine gyms in three different countries, That's and great. we want to get to thousands of gyms and helping people get off the arse at home hmm. into a gym, helping business owners generate more revenue from in their business, put, get, help them pull more members in because with the COVID stuff, it's been really hard for gym owners. So we're trying to really help them and help the members mm -hmm. and help everyone. But the members are going to find community and friends and relationships and not be isolated and not be alone. Hitting yeah. In the, in the, something different whenever you're doing it alone by yourself, like, you know, when you go lift weights or go on hit road work or what, hit a bag, you know, it, you just can't get up for it the same as if a training partner is right beside exactly, you or doing yeah. it with you. Yeah, exactly. And that's what we want. We want to build this community of boxing fitness. So this is boxing for fitness rather than boxing for fighting. Mm. And this is what I've kind of focused my energy on with me gyms in Los Angeles is uh, for fitness rather than for fighting. Uh, because you can get the benefits from boxing without getting punched in the head. Mm. You know, I'm not a fan of being punched in the head anymore. That's why when you mention you might be fighting again, I'm like, well, why? You yeah. know, uh, if, you, if, you, if you don't if you don't need to. So get the benefits from boxing and keep you, all your brain intact, uh, which the benefits is, is so, so good for boxing for fitness. So we want to help the gym owners with this and we can really help them with our, with our new business. Yeah. Yeah, you asked why, why fighting. Uh, I, I'm not sure what we are at on time, but um, I don't have, okay. Uh, I think for me, because I've had this conversation with Dr. Amon too, and, uh, uh, but I think I just have some unfinished business and haven't been able to do it right, do it sober, and I, I get to fight for people, for the nonprofit, and last year was our best year ever for fundraising and everything and this year's just been it's been tough like the times everything else but when i get to go on big podcasts like we get an influx or whenever i fight like there's never been like more traction on our website more donations that have come in than whenever i'm fighting and so so what was the first thing you said you said you, you want to fight because you got i think i've unfinished business and i want to come back at you with that yeah. and every fighter in the you're 35. Yeah. Every every fighter in the mid 30s that retire and then they come back, they come back for I've got unfinished business and yeah. Not to be negative, but it, sometimes it doesn't work out well for them. Yeah. If you look at the, I mean, the I prime example of someone like Roy Jones, who's my favorite fighter ever, he kind of retired, come back, and we've seen it time and time and time again. And the reason why I'm seeing this mate is because. I'm worried about my brain health. Right. You've got you've got other reasons than unfinished business. But I'll, if if it was just unfinished business, right. I don't know if you have another fight. Will finish that business. Yeah. I'm I'm not sure. But if you've got the other reasons, like the you know your nonprofit, which you, you're doing unbelievable stuff with, you know, you. then then it's that, that's that's different. Yeah. Well, I think I think it's it's I put myself on there because first because my last three fights, I put myself on their last. 
and it was just for the nonprofit, which was, which was really great because it was the only time I've ever smiled after a fight um, because I knew it wasn't just about me. It was bigger right. than me. This time I'm trying to do it for both. For them, I'm actually fighting for people, but I'm also fighting for myself, my relationship, like providing for the girls. My, my worry is, I'm sure your missus' worry is, is the, is the, is the health of getting punched in the head. What does Eamon say about it? Uh, he doesn't want his kids to really play soccer and head the ball playing right. soccer. Um, what do you say uh, about you? Did he, did he talk about you fighting? Yeah, and you know what? I'll talk to him again when I go out there for my follow up. But um, you know, he says he doesn't really want anyone fighting. But he said that in my case, I actually do have one of the healthiest brains for right. a fighter. And if I do the right things, like the hyperbaric oxygen therapy, get the right sleep, try to negate the head trauma as much as possible, um, then you know he can't stop me is what he said yeah, so yeah. i think i think i have to take everything into consideration and really think about you know the risk versus reward and then um so yeah i think i, I, yeah. I i'm grateful i care that you care yeah. about me and my health and all that and the longevity yeah and with, with, with retiring from fighting or mma i'm sure it's the same is you know it's it's never I've never heard one fighter ever say it's easy. You know, everyone thinks, you know, I'll, I'll have one more, I'll have one more. And I was kind of blessed that I didn't have the option to have one more, mm. or I might have had one more, then another one. And I'm really happy with how it ended up, how I ended up being forced to retire. At first, I didn't know what I was going to do the rest of my life. But now, you know, I've still got my brain intact, got mm. kids now, and, and, other responsibilities and now for me being forced to retire was the best thing that could have happened to us but if I was given the option I would have probably kept fighting on and fighting on and fighting on not knowing when to stop so this is where me worry comes when I hear a fighter say you know I'd, I'd never won my last fight I, I, need to, I need to finish on a high I need, I, I, I've got unfinished business I always think like maybe, maybe, maybe that business has been finished yeah but uh, again, I'm not being negative. I don't want to put that sort of doubts in sure. your mind. I'm just giving you my, my point of view from boxing, and I know MMA is different, different to to boxing. Uh, but you mentioned Brendan Sharp there. I don't know if you know. I, I trained Brendan for his last three fights. Yeah. Uh, and you know, even though he didn't get that badly hurt uh, in his fights, I think he he, he won against Matt Mitrione, and then. Uh, Andrei Oloski, I think he should have won that fight. It was a close fight. And then the Travis Brown fight, uh, yeah, he, he got beat up pretty bad there. Uh, I think he, maybe that, uh, well, well, whatever. But he retired at the right time. Yeah. And then he focused all of his energy, because he worked really, really hard. He focused his energy into the entertainment business. Mm -hmm. And then what, what I spoke about earlier on about enough. fighters, yeah, well, if fighters put that work ethic into something else, what Brendan has done, prime example of that in his businesses podcasting comedy starting his own like studio or yeah content man. all He's that it. so it, Brent and i were training partners um we lived together on the ultimate fighter tv show and then are we on the that, same moved, fight yeah. with brendan oh really yeah. and then i moved to colorado because of him and coach t or trevor Whitman oh wow and i never knew that all yeah. those and still good buddies with rashad evans and yeah um no you're right and i think it was a really hard time for him because he had to really confront while wanting to continue yeah. But then whenever he decided, it was, it was definitely the right move for him. Yeah, we're going to put him on the spot. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Right? that was, that was a tough was good one. For they're, they're great friends, and it was good for him. So I think, I think I'm going to test it. And, I mean, I could have, getting ready for either a short notice fight uh, there at the UFC, um, or I might take a, a, a tune-up fight, smaller level, uh, get it in, test it. But in training, I feel better than I honestly feel better than I ever have Um Whenever I'm, go I feel like I'm more of a gamer than the guy in the training room. But so many guys are coming for war that I'm having to show up every single round, right. um, and it's 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 going pretty well. And so I think I think I'm in a place where I'm, I haven't I have come off significant time off, but not off any losses. I think it's technically a six fight win streak, and um, oh, got wow. some got some time never been knocked out or finished. Um, and for heavyweights, just that I think a little bit of a difference. And maybe this is in boxing too, but 
heavy lightweights, like the smallest weight classes, they are retiring at 32, 35. Oh, yeah, like 100%. Their speed disappears. Maybe their conditioning disappears. Timing, yeah. Timing. But in heavyweight, at least MMA, 40 years old, you can still be the UFC champion or 42 or Dan Henderson and Randy Couture, I think they were like 45, 46, 47, which they were freaks of nature and it was a different yeah. time and different testing. But um, but heavyweights, like I think you're entering your prime uh, from maybe 32 to 38. Yeah, no, so. it's the same with boxing as well. Heavyweights definitely have a longer career or, or older career, the peak later. Than, what do you than think that's heavyweight? from? Is it because it's a strength experience or? I don't know. You know, maybe it's because I might be totally wrong. Is that the lighter weights? There's, there's more output mm. because the, the the faster, the, the kind of throw more punches, the kind of work harder, they put the body through. Maybe a little bit more. I might be wrong, but heavyweights is a bit more slow pace compared to the light. What do you think? Yeah, I think you're right. I think that for at least when I look at MMA, um, the little guys are Energizer bunnies. Yeah, and they can. I think if you look at finish rates, it's something like atom weights or bantam weights. It's like one, two, or three out of ten fights. So ten to thirty percent are a finish. It almost always goes to, or most times it goes to a decision. But yet they're landing more head strikes through kicks, knees, punches, elbows. Right. Um, but they're like Energizer bunnies that keep coming back. Right. It's a uh, cat with nine lives. They get knocked down. They they come back up. But for heavyweights, it's a higher finishing rate, like a 60, 70, 80 percent of the time. It's a finish. It doesn't go to the scorecards. But I think that it's different because I think accumulatively the little guys take more damage. But I think with uh, the heavyweights, each shot has more consequences because mm. there's you, you are light heavyweight, right? Yeah. Like there's more there's more power behind it. Right. So I think the strength, the experience, the time, like picking your shots, and and maybe that comes by being seasoned. Right. And so I was a young heavyweight. The youngest guy I think I've ever fought was 28 years old. And I was 19 when wow. I first turned pro. So now that I'm 35, I feel like, well, I've never even had this this kind of advantage of like the old man strength, the yeah, little bit of the wisdom, life experience, being sober. Right. Um, and so I think, I think I'm going to give it a go. Well, I'm definitely going to be supporting you. Thank you. I'm a fan. And I'll definitely yeah, I appreciate be, yeah, you so much. Up. Yeah. Yeah. Anything I can help you with, with boxing, whatever. I love that. Know, I'm, I'm going to be checking out more of the videos. and. Great. The basics and yeah. uh, getting back to the fundamentals and making sure those are all tight. Yeah. And then the creativity. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. I, I'm really grateful. Amy, do you have anything that you wanted to ask that you didn't ask? Mm. Okay. Where can people follow you? I, I'd love you to list it all. We're going to put it in the show notes as well. Yeah. Uh, YouTube, if you want to learn boxing, Instagram. Yeah. I'm on all the platforms. That's the, that's the thing as well. I'm, I'm on I've, I've seen everywhere. You on TikTok even. I mean, I've got. I don't even post on there, but I've, I've seen you on there. <laughs> I've got like 12,000 followers on Pinterest. Wow. <laughs> Who uses Pinterest to watch boxing education videos? <laughs> Some people do. I get 2 million views a month on Pinterest. And wow. I, I, I don't even go on there myself. I've got someone <laughs> on my team just repurposing my content onto there. And I'm going, I'm like, who the hell's, who uses that? I don't even, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I'm on everywhere. I'm okay. everywhere, yeah. Wherever their favorite platform is to yeah. watch anything, go find Tony I'll Jeffries there, there. <laughs> uh, and be looking out for his Connect by Tony Jeffries. Yeah, yeah, and see how you can get into uh, actual community. If you're a gym owner, we have a, actually plenty of people that own gym that watch the show. And yeah, well, if they want to um, add boxing, yeah, we've got a turnkey solution to do it. Great, Tony. Thank you so much for your thank time, you. Sarah. Thank you for being here, Amy. Thank you, and Ibble. Thank you so much for having us in here, Doctor Jess. Thanks for being here to listen. And uh, Ibble Studios, this is great. I like this setup. Um, Me too. So yeah. Uh, please share this content out. If you want to uh, like, rate, review the podcast, we'd really appreciate that. Share Tony's uh, message out there because I know it's going to be valuable to, to you, your friends. Um, and thank you for being here. You, me, we have overcome 100% of our darkest days. Rise up. Overcome. Hey, don't forget to send your overcome stories to overcomepodcast at gmail.com. And also, rate, review, subscribe, and follow Overcome with Justin Wren.